There is a base level joy. I always say this, especially in 2023 for Chelsea Football Club and for Chelsea fans. We have to enjoy winning the game. And Pochettino did make a change, a tweet that did change the game. We have spoke so many times on this show about the low block problem and Chelsea not finding a solution. They did find a solution. And if we're just going to sit here when our team actually wins a game, because who knows when the next one's coming, and just go, well, we just dismiss it. Let's not enjoy it at all. Let's not take any positives about individual player performances. Then what are we doing here? Hello there, guys. Daniel Childs back here again for my rational perspective on Chelsea 2, Sheffield United 0. The first half was abysmal and I think there were even some people, even some I know, were considering going home and it did look like we were going towards a pretty disastrous afternoon, another one for Chelsea that would have put Mauricio Pochettino under even more pressure. But a win is a win is a win is a win and I don't think that it would do us any favours to sit here and still be cynical and still be negative. You know, I want to see Chelsea win every single game of football, even though I know that's unrealistic. And in 2023, that has been far from realistic. But I'm still happy. I'm always going to be happy about Chelsea winning a game. And that's kind of, and it's, it's a very simple takeaway from the game. But I mean, question of the day for you. Why is it just a problem to enjoy your team winning a football, especially in a year, in a season when we don't get a lot of wins? This was the first time Chelsea have put back-to-back home victories in the Premier League together since October 2022. Now, of course, in calendar year, that's only a year ago. But in terms of seasons, that feels like a very long time ago. It does in football, especially everything that's happened since. So I'm more positive than negative, And I'm positive because of the reaction at halftime and the tweak that Mauricio Pochettino made, which really is the key takeaway today that I think made the huge difference in the start of the second half that changed the game won Chelsea the game got us the three points and hopefully maybe as the start of a turnaround we can hope right and, and I want to be more optimistic than negative and nihilistic about this Chelsea team um, but yeah let's get into the starting lineup so it was close to what I wanted to see I didn't get a chance to make a preview for this game but I think my big frustration with the starting lineup and I think it was justified by the first half was the lack of natural fullbacks. Now, I know that Malo Gusto probably isn't ready, but then, as we'll get to with Nkunku, why you're on the bench if you're not ready. And you've got Ian Matson, and the comments that Pochettino made about Ian Matson pre-game kind of suggested that maybe he was about to start. The fact that you had Dezassi and Colwell as the two fullbacks, I think really hurt Chelsea in the first half. You know, there are many ways in which Chelsea failed to to break down or create quality opportunities against a very defensive Sheffield United team with a lot of the ball, how passive we were in possession, how certain players' decision-making was woeful, how there was a lack of movement at times in front of the ball. But all of that said, I don't think it helps you. And I think Pochettino learned this at half-time. It wasn't by changing the fullbacks, it was by tweaking other players in the front line. But it's quite obvious. You need width against a low block. You need overlaps you need um the ability to overload at times because it did feel like a lot of the time in that first half there was such a lack of movement and ability to try and expose Sheffield United or try and ask them difficult questions and it felt like Raheem Sterling and Mikhailo Mudrik kind of had to do a lot of stuff on their own and then of course you had Moise Casado kind of sitting as a six today he was kind of doing a lot of work on his own and I think as you know other people have pointed out for me he was my man of the match today speak a little bit more about that but then you had Gallagher you had Cole Palmer and then we had Nicholas Jackson returning to the team Benoit Badia Shil Thiago Silva as the back two I was happy to see that and of course Petrovic starting his first game as a Chelsea goalkeeper the first half that there's no two ways about it was devastating to watch and it was really really depressing now I don't think that first half was the worst half of football by Chelsea this season or this year it was just a depressing thing of here we are again. It felt it had so many shades of the Southampton defeat under Graham Potter. It had sh- so many shades of, say, the defeat to Brentford earlier this season. You pick out many games of this nature over this season, recent years, and you know where it's going. It felt very inevitable that Chelsea were either going to just go to a, a score draw against the worst defence in the Premier League and the worst team currently in the Premier League, or somehow Sheffield United would find a way to win, which would be disgusting would be devastating would be a way to really ruin Christmas but the fact you know it is the season of giving and Chelsea are very charitable 12 months of the year you know you were very concerned 
But I have to say at halftime, Pochettino did earn his money. Now, the tweak he made, and I think as Oli Glanville pointed out rightly on, on Twitter after this, you know, it's kind of a little bit concerning that we didn't think of this at the start and it's taken you 45 minutes to realise this. But he spoke about after the game, Chelsea were able to exploit out wide. They finally started to use the width of their front players and the tweak that was made that was a key tweak that instantly changed the game and won Chelsea the game to create those two goals was taking Cole Palmer out of a more central position in a 4-2-3-1, shifting him out wider and actually moving Raheem Sterling into... You could call it a number 10. I think it was more of a second striker role uh, with Jackson moving a little bit to the left. You have Sterling in there, which is interesting with the return of Nkunku, how positionally that works for Chelsea, especially against opponents of this ilk. And it worked wonders. I thought the rotations between those players was a lot more smoother. Chelsea suddenly had, um, it seemed like a consistent way of getting into dangerous areas and it did kind of feel like against a, a an opponent of this quality the first goal is always key it was for me if Chelsea had scored say earlier in the season against Brentford I think like a lot of these games and Chelsea have so regularly failed to do so if you score the first goal nine times out of ten I think you go on to win the game because it was so clear that Sheffield United had very little to offer after that and uh, they seemed very derailed and shattered by that. And I think, you know, it was it was also a case of just quality. Raheem Sterling getting to the byline, making a difference, putting a really good ball across the box. And there was Cole Palmer in the right place to finish it off uh, clinically. And then with the second goal, it was a little bit of a mess. I mean, in terms of, I thought the build-up was nice, but in terms of the way everyone sort of was just a, a little bit confused at whether it was a goal, whether it was going to be given as a corner, where we're going to get a penalty... And Nicholas Jackson, who got a lot of stick from the Stanford Bridge crowd today, does score a goal. And um, really, that was it. I mean, we did have the chance of a potential penalty. Oh, man, O'Broya. I mean, O'Broya's got to be scoring that chance. And it was another great move down the right. Cole Palmer out wide, getting in there and have a really good ball across the box. Um, but other than that, it just kind of strolled then to a 2-0 win, a very routine. And I can't really have too much of a go at the players and, and Pochettino if there is a sense that we took our foot off the gas. We needed the three points today to keep our Premier League season alive, to just get things at a steady pace again after a very difficult week for Mauricio Pochettino in Chelsea. So we needed to win this game. And if pre-game you were like, please just win by any means necessary, even though, yeah, context, it is against the worst team in the league. We did the job. We kept a clean sheet. And there were some, I think, decent individual performances, which I'll go through now. I think Casado really stands out for me as the key player, one that um, I, I thought just did a lot of dirty work. I thought done a lot of things that tried to keep Chelsea pressing and try to keep Chelsea attacks alive. Um, just constantly seemed to be there, especially in the second half as Chelsea's intensity and performance went up. To it, It's just that classic defensive midfielder kind of role where it's just get the ball relate to someone else, get the ball relate to someone else, get the ball relate to someone else, be there, win those 50-50s, relate to someone else. Again, very simple things here. Um, he's not a metronome. He's not going to do a Cesc Fabregas and find a world-class ball out of nowhere. But today he did a very steady job. And I thought that physically he really um, stepped up and I think took that role on when you know it wasn't kind of a pivot. It was more of him on, on his own. And I felt that worked really well. And I thought that Benoit Badia-Shill looked brilliant today as well. Um, I thought he was just physically dominant. And again, these are kind of, we, you do have to, you know, contextualize this. You, have, you do have to caveat this with the level of opponent and the lack of attacking threat that Chelsea came under today, of course. But, you know, I think for Benoit Badia-Shill after such a difficult, um, and for the whole defense after a difficult week or so where they've been really analysed and, and criticised. I think it, it was a, a good response by them. And they, and I like some of the times that Benoit was able to move the ball forward, looked a little bit expressive. I thought Dezassi was really reserved and really turgid in the first half. But as a fullback, I think he was a lot more expressive in the second half. Again, he's not a fullback. He really shouldn't be playing there. We should have a better option. And hopefully Malagosta will return shortly um, as a starter. But all things being said, win is a win. Um, I, the things I want to point out today is, you know, so I, I get out of the ground and listen, it's not the greatest Chelsea performance. There are still concerns. Why were we 45 minutes in against this level of team with barely creating any high quality opportunities? Yes. And then also Christopher Nkunku. I mean, I, I just question why is he on the bench? If he's not 
if he's not ready to play, and this is kind of a general rule, also the nonsense two goalkeeper rule, keeping him on the bench, I think it's just a slap in the face to the academy. And I just think it's a nonsense. Why do we need two goalkeepers on the bench? I just see it across football. I just don't get it. I just think it's a complete nonsense trend I've seen in recent years. Makes absolutely no sense. But then seeing the reactions after from Chelsea fans um, that kind of, I mean, some of those were expressed inside the ground. Some of those weren't. That almost wanted to kind of still be in a pent up angry mood that almost was trying to react to the game as if we hadn't scored two goals and we had lost or drew and really angry at Pochettino. And I just think that, listen, there are concerns, there are criticisms, there are things to be very cynical about at the moment. And I have expressed that on this show over the past week or so, because I think it's absolutely valid to be concerned about the direction of the football club. But there is a base level joy. I always say this, especially in 2023 for Chelsea Football Club and for Chelsea fans. We have to enjoy winning the game. And Pochettino did make a change, a tweet that did change the game. We have spoke so many times on this show about the low block problem and Chelsea not finding a solution. They did find a solution. And if we're just going to sit here when our team actually wins a game, because who knows when the next one's coming, and just go, well, we just dismiss it. Let's not enjoy it at all. Let's not take any positives about individual player performances. Then what are we doing here? Like as a supporter, I think you do need to enjoy the wins, especially when they're not that frequent. And also as a coach, I think you do need to give credit. It's 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 a little bit weird to me that, you know, I've seen post analysis that says that Pochettino doesn't really change anything, but then his tactical tweak in that game did change the game in a massive way. And I just... You know, it's this kind of constant binary back and forth of like everything has to be the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. And, you know, you can't really both say that you have concerns about that first half performance considering the level of opponent. But then also in the second half, go, we scored two goals. We could have had more and we win the game. Phew, we move on to the next one. That's really it. So those are my thoughts. As ever, please let me know yours. You can vote for your player of the match. I mean, the the last time I looked at the poll... It was pretty heavily Cole Palmer. There's an argument for Cole, um, for Conor Gallagher to be in there as well. I also do want to pick this out because, you know, Nicholas Jackson scoring again. He now has seven Premier League goals or seven goals, sorry, this season. One assist in 12 league starts. Cole Palmer has six goals and three assists in 10 league starts. Again, Nicholas Jackson and Cole Palmer, especially Nicholas Jackson, is a very raw player. And we knew that when, he bought, when we bought him. But the fact that when you compare his numbers to, say, recent years like Timo Werner, Kai Havertz, and the fact that he's already hitting those numbers, and if he continues on this rate of goals for the rest of this season, and he hits about 15, 16, that's not tragic. That's not woeful for a player who hasn't played a lot of football at this level. He is being asked to do a lot. Again, I'm not going to sit here and just blindly say everything's fine with him, but I do want to give the context of him being such a young player and I'm judging him not as a 90 million 150 million player that I ever expected to walk into Chelsea and bang 40 goals instantly now you can scream as much as you want and I in some ways I can understand it why haven't we got that player in a center forward role but I think it's unfair to judge Nicholas Jackson as a player of a category that he's not and at a stage of a, of his development that he's not. If he's playing like this in like five years time, no matter where he is, different conversation. If he's coming to Chelsea as a player who's just come off of like a really big goal scoring season in the Bundesliga, I expect a lot more of him. Context matters. And the context here is that Nicholas Jackson has a long, long way to go. There are many parts of his game that frustrate me in terms of movement, in terms of his first touch, in terms of his awareness. These are all things that I think Chelsea knew when they bought him. Again, those are wider concerns and arguments that we've had about the transfer strategy. But as an individual, when I look at those numbers and I compare it to recent years, they're not numbers that you can just wipe away as irrelevant. They show a player that actually, with more time, could get better and produce better numbers. So that's just another thing I wanted to point out in today's show. So if you did enjoy this content, please do uh, me a massive favor by hitting the like button. Really does help the show out. Gets it on the algorithm, gets it to more listeners and viewers. If you want to see more Chelsea content across the Christmas period as we head into a massive 2024, please do hit that subscribe button. It's free to do. Turn those notifications on. You can listen to the show as a podcast as well. For those who do listen that way, I really do appreciate it. And if you did enjoy listening to the show, please do give us a positive rating review. It also really helps out 
on the podcast charts as well. So thank you. Have a great rest of your weekend and I will see you and probably be speaking to you at a very um, near time, hopefully with more positive stuff around Chelsea. All the best.